You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War episode 176. Over the course of 1918, a serious change occurred in the conduct and action of the war. What had been a mostly static, long slog over the course of the first three years had opened up, and the fighting had become more open and far more fluid. It was clear that this heralded the end of the war. The only question was when and how it would end. This is what we will be discussing in the next three episodes. Today we will focus on the situation in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and on the German home front. Serious, serious problems developed in both countries as the stress of the long war finally caused the previous status quo to fall apart. How specifically this happened and the ramification of these changes was different in both countries based on their specific societies, but in both cases they boiled down to the civilians being very much done with the war and seeking a way out. After we discuss the home front, we will then look at the peace notes that had circulated around Europe during October 1918. In these notes, the German government communicated with President Wilson of the Americans. The Germans were searching for a way out of the war, and they hoped that the American president would give them an easier path than the Entente. These communications would eventually lead to the armistice discussions, but not before their contents would cause a drastic shift in the German political landscape and cause the removal of several key German leaders in the military. We have discussed the situation on the German home front in pretty good detail over the years, with entire episodes being devoted to just discussing food shortages, but things were worse in Austria-Hungary. Things were always worse in Austria-Hungary. Food was scarcer, the government was less controlling, which led to more hoarding, and the society as a whole was just far more fractured. This led to some real hardship around the country in the latter stages of the war, and this led to a general feeling of dissatisfaction with the situation in 1918, explained quite well by an 18-year-old from Silesia, Ruff Hoffner. He would say, quote, Four whole years we've had war. Some people will say we've got used to it. I have perhaps sometimes so spoken, but no. It is not true. We who wants a new peace will never get used to it. We who in war turn from children into adults will get used to hunger and poor clothing, but never to the sorrow of war, which destroys any budding happiness like frost with the first tender flowers on a spring night. She is everywhere, this lingering sorrow. Go where you will, God in heaven, when will it end? In 1918, the people of Central Europe, no matter where they lived, existed in a state of misery during this time. Unfortunately, their situation would not improve at all during the last six months of the war, and would instead continue to get worse. There were two large problems, the first being food, of which there would be even less during the summer of 1918, and the rise of influenza. Vienna was in a particularly bad state when it came to food, causing the Austrian government to take drastic steps of forcefully confiscating Romanian grain that was actually on its way to Germany. Obviously, the Germans did not appreciate this action, but the Austrian officials believed that it was the only way to stave off starvation in the city. There were areas of the empire that were still well provisioned with grain and other food, but both of these regions were areas where the central government was beginning to lose control. In Bohemia, the Czechs were pushing towards independence, and in Galicia, the Poles were doing much the same. 
neither group was a big fan of the empire, and so they began to obstruct further grain shipments. To add to these general problems, the government also had sort of lost its ability to sway public opinion. Just like everywhere else during the war, the Austro-Hungarian government had used propaganda heavily to maintain some level of support for the war. That when things were going so poorly so often, propaganda can only work for so long, and by 1918 its time in the empire had run out. While at times the leaders of the empire seemed a bit powerless, that did not mean that they did not see what was happening. The governments of both Austria, Hungary, and Germany were not completely out of touch with the situation in their countries, and so they both attempted to institute changes from above, a revolution from above, so to speak, that they hoped would alter the situation enough to keep the countries together. The most important of these changes were political reforms. For Austria-Hungary, political reforms were a tricky subject, since any reduction in central power and authority would result in possible dissolution of the empire. But with the empire about to dissolve anyway, on October 16, 1918, Emperor Karl issued the People's Manifesto. This document stated that the empire would reorganize itself on a federal basis, with groups given the ability to have some level of autonomy within it. This document had the support of the German Austrians, but found a steadfast enemy in the form of Hungarian leaders. The Hungarians were vehemently opposed to any reform of the empire, because they knew that any reforms would chip away at their privileged position that they had occupied within the dual monarchy. There were also concerns that if the People's Manifesto was enacted, all the land that the Hungarian officials controlled, much of which was not populated by Hungarians, might move out of Hungarian influence. To add extra punctuation to their complaints, the Hungarians threatened to halt food deliveries unless their lands were expressly excluded from the manifesto. When this threat proved to be insufficient to prevent the introduction of the manifesto as written, the Hungarian leaders announced that they no longer considered themselves bound by the 1867 Compromise, which had originally created the Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy. This essentially dissolved the empire. Elsewhere, while the People's Manifesto was a good document, the people within the empire saw it as too little and too late. In July, the Czechoslovak National Committee had been created, and by October, several other minorities within the empire had formed similar groups. The Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes had formed up in Zagreb, and the Polish Council of Regency had formed up in Warsaw. These groups were no longer satisfied with limited autonomy within the empire. They wanted full independence. Nothing else would be satisfactory. Violence erupted in many parts of the country. In Hungary, the situation deteriorated rapidly. On October 27th, a 30,000 strong protest assembled outside Hungarian parliament in Budapest. When the police fired into this protest, the violence instantly escalated. A new national committee was created, and it overthrew the official government of the country. Some soldiers then decided to move out of the country and find the former president Tisa's villa. When they arrived, they murdered him, stating that it was to avenge the role that he played in starting the war and getting Hungary involved way back in 1914. There was violence in other areas as well. Wherever there was a minority group, there was possibility of violence against them. For example, in North Bohemia, where there was a narrow German majority, they declared that they were part of German Austria, but when the Czechs moved in and made it clear that this region and its population was staying in Bohemia and the future Czechoslovakia, well, things didn't go well. These are just two examples of countless acts of violence, big and small, that would engulf the empire towards the end of the war and after. In Germany, the politicians would also attempt to implement some drastic reforms to stave off possible revolution. The first move, as we discussed in previous episodes, was to appoint a new government under Prince Max of Baden. There was also a conscious effort to create a more diverse and left-leaning government, with ministers being brought in from the progressive, center, and social democratic parties. While this greatly shifted the control of the government to the left, it did not alter the desire of the government to continue the fight. The number one goal of these reforms was to increase the unity of the German society so that maybe resistance at the front would increase as well, and better peace terms could then be obtained during negotiations. These changes were about all that the political leadership in Germany could do within the confines of maintaining the status quo of monarchy, Reichstag, and war. They hoped that it would be enough to keep the country together and to appease the Allies, especially Wilson. 
The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. While these reforms were happening, the Germans were also sending peace notes to Wilson. And while these were an important step towards eventual peace, it did have some negative effects on German society. The first note was sent to Wilson on October the 1st, and it would be the first in a series of communications between Berlin and Washington during October. Wilson's response to this note would arrive on October 9th, and it made several demands of the Germans. The first was that the cancellation of the unrestricted submarine campaign, which the Germans readily agreed to. It also said that Wilson did not have the authority to dictate peace terms, and that those terms would instead be determined by the political and military leaders of all of the Allies. The response also asked for many more details from the Germans, especially about Germany's agreements with the 14 points. The German response then clarified some of these pieces, but most importantly, asked that the Entente be held to the same standard as the Germans. The Germans also made it clear that they had formed a new government that was elected by the majority of the German people. When news of the notes first circulated around Germany, it was received very positively by most Germans. However, when it did not immediately result in peace talks, and with news that the German army would continue the fight and to try and secure better terms, morale on the home front collapsed even further. Back at the front, Ludendorff was already beginning to change his mind on the whole situation. This would have been during the lull in the Allied offensives during the first two weeks of October, while they were sort of resting up before they started again, and he started to think that maybe the Germans really could hold out to winter, and then maybe on to spring. Prince Max was completely against doing anything that could jeopardize the possibility of peace, setting the stage for a confrontation between Ludendorff and Max later in October. For the first time since 1914, the political leadership of Germany, embodied in Max, had a considerable amount of power because they had been trumpeted as the leaders of a new, more democratic Germany. If they were now replaced with even a hint that it was at the request of the military, it would paint an incredibly negative impression, when at the time all Germany was trying to do was impress uh, somebody, anybody, that they were making the right moves towards something better. News of the peace notes when they reached the front did nothing to reduce the drive of the Allied commanders to continue to attack. When Haig and Foch received the news of the first note, Foch would say that, quote, Here, here is the immediate result of the British piercing the Hindenburg line. The enemy has asked for an armistice. If anything, the idea that the Germans were seeking a political end to the war just increased the desire of the Allies to keep attacking, to make sure that they did not have any room to breathe. While their armies kept fighting in London and Paris, there was some concern about how much of a role Wilson was playing in these discussions, and most importantly, how easy he might go on the Germans. While this was a legitimate concern given the 14 points that Wilson had introduced himself, and his general conciliatory attitude towards the Germans before the Americans entered the war, 
1918, the British and French need not worry. In Wilson's notes to Germany on the 16th and 21st, he was far more clear about what he wanted from the Germans. First, he said that there would be not be an agreement with Germany until they stopped the illegal and inhumane processes, which they still persist in. There were several different actions that he was probably referring to here, the situation in Eastern Europe, where the Germans had taken over and now controlled vast swaths of territory thanks to Brest-Litovsk, the treatment of civ civilians behind the front, and then just the general fact that they were continuing to fight the war. The note on the 21st was even more precise about what should happen. It outlined that Germany must follow all of the directives of the president, and that included taking steps to make it impossible for the country to renew the war. This meant giving up artillery, trains, guns, munitions, a whole laundry list of things that the Allies wanted before talks could even begin. This also would mean surrendering all occupied territory. The tensions within the German government would then peak with Wilson's note on the 21st because it also included a demand for wide-ranging political reforms. He would say that, quote, the United States cannot deal with any but veritable representatives of the German people. What he really meant with this note is that the Americans would not deal with anything but a democratically elected government, and they would also not deal with one that had a monarch, you know, like a Kaiser? When news of this got around the newspapers of Germany, the people began to demand an abdication from the Kaiser, but he was not quite ready to give up his throne. The German response agreed to some of Wilson's demands, for example the evacuation of all occupied territories and a halt to the U-boat campaign. With the agreement to these terms, the German government made it clear that it would do just about anything to try and get an armistice. It was right around this point that Hindenburg and Ludendorff started to have serious second thoughts about the entire peace process. Up to this point, they had been supporters of seeking an armistice, even though they also believed that it was possible that the army could make it into 1919. But they hoped that an earlier peace process would leave them in better negotiating positions. It was now clear, with the peace notes from Wilson, that reasonable terms, whatever the German military defined those as, was not going to be on the table. This caused the military leaders to shift their thinking, and on October 24th, they sent out a proclamation to the army. In this proclamation, they spelled out the latest information from Wilson's notes and denounced the process entirely, saying that it represented unconditional surrender. Prince Max was furious that this note had been sent out, because it very clearly called into question the political leadership of Germany. Therefore, he went to the Kaiser, and he said that Ludendorff had to go, or Max himself would resign. We will learn about the Kaiser's answer next episode. However, in the last few days of October, the Germans would send a final note to Wilson that stated that Germany, quote, looked forward to proposals for an armistice that would usher in a piece of justice as outlined by the president. The German politicians were done with the war, and they were asking for exactly what they had to do to get out of it, and soon. While the leaders of the army were beginning to rebel against the political developments, a similar situation was developing in the navy. In August, the high seas fleet had been placed under the new command of Admiral Hipper, previously the commander of Germany's battle cruisers. He had been placed in command of the fleet and had been going along pretty well since then. The German ships had spent most of the last two years sitting in port, but the chief of the naval staff, Admiral Scheer, now wanted to change that. Scheer was angry that the government had ordered him to halt the U-boat campaign and to bring the submarines back to port, an effort to placate the Allies during discussions. With this frustration in mind, Scheer decided to send the fleet out on a final offensive operation. The goal was to find the British Grand Fleet and engage it. The goal was not to survive. Hipper would write that this was an attempt for, quote, an honorable battle by the fleet, even if it should fight to the death, and it will sow the seed for a new German fleet in the future, end quote. The orders for the operation were issued on October 24th. The entire fleet would leave port at night and advance into the North Sea. There they would execute some raids with the purpose of pulling the Grand Fleet down from Scotland, and then they would meet them in final climactic battle. What the German naval commanders had not predicted, but what seems very obvious in hindsight, is that the German sailors were not huge fans of this idea of a suicidal mission. As news of the orders started to float around the German fleet, the war weariness of the sailors started to take control of the situation. When the German ships passed through the locks at Wilhelmshaven, 300 men from the Derflinger and Von der Tann, all long-service veterans, climbed over the side of the ships and just disappeared. 
On the following night, mutinies began aboard many ships and then naval barracks on shore. This would then spread to all of the ships, with even some of the largest, newest, and best equipped ships in the fleet falling to the mutineers. With the crews mutinying, it was decided that the operation had to be cancelled, but the situation within the fleet had already gone too far, and the mutinies would continue. Even those ships that had gotten things back under control, often arresting any people who had participated in the mutiny, found themselves under pressure from other sailors to let them go, with 4,000 sailors in Kiel protesting and eventually securing the release of sailors aboard the ship's the 3rd Battle Squadron. During the first few days of November, the sailors and soldiers of Kiel created soldiers' councils, just like in Russia. In Wilhelmshaven, things were even worse, with almost 35,000 armed men in the streets. By November 9th, Scheer would write to the Kaiser to let him know that the German leaders could no longer rely on the navy. The Allied military leaders did not know about all of these developments, but they did know that the Germans were seeking peace terms, and so they would have to determine what those would actually be. Haig, Patan, and Pershing would meet on October 28th, and they would each have different opinions about what they expected the Germans to do to earn an armistice. Haig would be the most lenient, just demanding that the Germans evacuate their army from all occupied territory and Alsace-Lorraine. Patan would, of course, occupy the middle ground, demanding the same as Haig with the addition of pushing the Germans back to the Rhine River to the north of Alsace-Lorraine. This would leave a good chunk of the German homeland in Allied hands. Pershing wanted far harsher terms, with even more German territory being occupied by the Allies. For the Americans, their war was just a beginning, and Pershing saw little need to end it quickly and easily now that the American army was in the fight. The British and French were at the end of a very long war, and they were also concerned with the growing strength of the Americans. If the war continued too much longer, they might find themselves as lesser partners in the alliance, no longer able to lead the decision, but instead being stuck behind the Americans. The conversation among the military leaders would continue until the first week of November, before an agreement with re was reached, the terms of which we will discuss next episode when it is presented to the Germans. Also, just going to end by saying that while all of these discussions and decisions were being made, thousands of soldiers were dying every day at the front, and that would continue until November 11th. I pick on it.